Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hi, I'm Dr. Eileen Chung, and this is part one of the rapid review on pediatric diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA. Unlike with adults, when pediatric patients present with DKA, it may be their first ever presentation with diabetes, period. And oftentimes, they present with such nonspecific symptoms that the diagnosis of diabetes can be missed. So in this first video, we'll go over the pearls to look for on history and physical that may lead you to suspect a diagnosis of DKA. We'll also go over the definition of DKA in pediatrics and how to classify its severity. And finally, we'll talk about the general approach to managing pediatric DKA, emphasizing the key differences between management principles in adults versus peds. In part two of this rapid review, we'll take a deeper dive into the finer points of pediatric DKA management. While our jobs would be made much easier if every pediatric patient or the parents came in volunteering words like polydipsia or polyuria, in real life, this just doesn't happen. Often, you have to ask about these symptoms specifically, and even then, they may not be key features to the presentation. So in the previously undiagnosed child, what are other signs and symptoms that should catch your attention and make you think that this patient may be presenting with diabetes? Well, on history, here's some red flag symptoms that should put diabetes on your radar fatigue, weight loss, and isolated vomiting, or vomiting coupled with abdominal pain when the abdominal exam is benign, and headaches, especially in the absence of a fever or signs of meningismus. On physical exam, the major diagnostic pearl is the respiratory exam. Tachypnea without indrawing or other signs of increased work of breathing should trigger a consideration of a metabolic acidosis. This is especially true with a clear chest on exam. You may also see Kussmaul's breathing, which is tachypnea with deep respirations. If the child is known to have type 1 diabetes, have a high index of suspicion for DKA if they're presenting with these clinical features and are from a population at higher risk for DKA. These high-risk populations are teenagers, children who are on insulin pumps because of pump failure, and children from lower socioeconomic households. For all of the patients that we just talked about, consider getting a capillary glucose and a urinalysis looking for glucose and ketones. In your assessment, it's also important to consider, diagnose, and manage any precipitating cause that might have tipped this child into DKA. So how do we make a diagnosis of DKA in the pediatric population? Well, for one, they should have some of the clinical features that we've talked about previously, and then they should have all three of the laboratory diagnostic criteria, which are pretty self-explanatory because the name, diabetic ketoacidosis. For the diabetic part of it, they need to have a random serum glucose of 11.1 millimoles per liter or greater. Ketosis should be detected either in urinalysis or urine dipstick. Note that serum ketones are not part of the diagnostic criteria and don't need to be drawn. And for the acidosis part of the diagnosis, the pH on VBG should be less than 7.3 or the bicarb on lights or VBG less than 15. It's important to classify pediatric DKA into mild, moderate, or severe because it's instrumental in helping to guide management. This classification is based purely on lab values. A diagnosis of mild DKA is made for pH less than 7.3 on VBG or bicarb level less than 15. A diagnosis of moderate DKA is made for pH less than 7.2 or bicarb level less than 10. And severe DKA is diagnosed when the pH is less than 7.1 or bicarb level less than 5. Now that we've made the diagnosis of DKA and determined how severe the DKA is, let's move on to discussing the general approach to management. The goals for DKA management are the same, no matter whether it's an adult or a child. We want to correct hypovolemia, correct acidosis, reverse the ketosis, and restore normal glycemia. And the mainstays of treatment are also the same, fluids, insulin, and potassium. The main difference is how aggressive we are in our resuscitation. And the reason we're much more careful and less aggressive in our treatment of kids with DKA is because they're much more susceptible to cerebral edema. Kids can either present with cerebral edema as a complication of their DKA, in which case we don't want to worsen it, or we can actually precipitate it with aggressive resuscitation. We'll go into more detail in part two, but I'll just emphasize the main differences here. The first two are the most important. First, with fluids, we're much more judicious with the volumes impedes. 
Specifically, no fluid bolus should be given unless the child is in decompensated shock. That means no fluid bolus unless they're hypotensive for their age. Second, with insulin, no bolus should be given, period. It's also recommended that you don't start insulin until one to two hours after you started rehydrating your patient, which may be relatively delayed compared to when it would be started in adults. In patients with DKA, there's usually a total body depletion of potassium, but the serum potassium level can sometimes be high in adults for various reasons. And like in adults, this is much less likely to be the case in children. So third, potassium replacement is introduced earlier in the treatment of pediatric DKA. Fourth, there is no role for sodium bicarb unless the child is peri-arrest or has arrested from DKA. And last, but definitely not least, you want to get help early. Because the fluid balance in treating these patients is tricky, you'll want to talk to the pediatrician or pediatric endocrinologist as soon as you make a diagnosis of DKA, so they can help guide your management and arrange for follow-up. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground, so let's review the main points from this review. Number one, kids with new onset diabetes presenting with DKA can be challenging. Be on the alert and consider doing a capillary glucose and urinalysis in those presenting with constitutional symptoms, isolated vomiting, headache, and a constellation of symptoms that don't quite fit, so vomiting with complaints of abdominal pain and a benign abdomen, or tachypnea without increased work of breathing and a clear chest on exam. Number two, to make a diagnosis of DKA, you need both clinical features and all three lab criteria for DKA. Number three, after you've diagnosed DKA, classify it into mild, moderate, or severe DKA using lab values. And number four, kids with DKA are much more at risk of developing cerebral edema than adults with DKA. Because of this, management of pediatric DKA is much less aggressive. Consult a pediatrician early to help guide management, do not bolus insulin, and do not bolus fluids unless your patient is hypotensive. I'll see you in part two for a deeper dive into pediatric DKA management.